The environmentalist cult must be stopped. But the only way you or I can stop it is if we understand it, if we understand where it comes from, how it developed, and why precisely it is acting in the way it does. And by the end of this video, I promise you, you will have a better understanding of the ideological origins and roots of the environmentalist cult which is running roughshod over the West right now, which has bought out essentially nonprofit organizations, bought out politicians, has ran fear campaigns for decades upon decades upon decades, has tried to push legislation spurred by those fear campaigns to limit economic productivity, and all, all this and more has, in many cases, blocked public um, roadways in order to protest oil and protest the greenhouse gas uh, crisis, so to speak, the, co the climate ecological crisis. You will understand all of that and more by the end of this video. And even if you're not an expert, you will be able to better assess and deal with these ideas than people who merely scream at the wind and dismiss these foul actors are able to. Now, my friends, again, as I mentioned, environmentalism, we have to understand environmentalism by itself is not a bad thing. In fact, environmentalism by itself is an impulse that I think all human beings should have. We live in a planet, we live in an environment that feeds us and by consequence, we also feed it. It provides us with all the sustenance that we need for life. It provides us with all the necessities of life and everything like that. So in my opinion, being an environmentalist in the sense of being a conservationist seems rather intuitive to me. But this modern day form of environmentalism that goes beyond mere stewardship, which means taking care of the land and taking care of the, the land that you have in your possession or taking care of the land around you. It goes beyond mere stewardship and goes towards something much more sinister and much more vile that takes the aesthetic of being a caretaker and uses it for its own ends. So let's ask ourselves, my friends, where did modern day environmentalism come from? Because of course, the modern day environmentalist movement is pushing things like environmental social governance scores, which are essentially social credit scores that keep track of how well corporations are being ideologically indoctrinated by ideas that, according to these people, are, are settled by science. And if you challenge them, you're a reality denier. That's one vestige of this movement. Another vestige of this movement is the push to eliminate gasoline cars and push everything towards over electric cars uh, that has been quite popular. In California, for example, there was a push to eliminate all gasoline-powered cars by 2050. And I can keep going on and on and on and on. This entire apparatus of political and social action fueled by this movement, and yet few people know where it comes from. And so I want to actually characterize the environmentalist movement by addressing a few of its foundational points. Because as I say on this channel all the, time, all the time, my friends, it's not important. The argument itself, what the argument says, is not important. What the argument assumes and presumes is important. Because if an argument presumes a false idea, and you can demonstrate that argument is based on a false idea, the argument itself falls apart automatically without you even addressing it. So let me, let me give you an example. If I say, Todd is at the park today with his son. Well, the argument itself is saying, well, Todd is with his son at the park. And no one would really think that's anything wrong with that on its face. But that argument has several presumptions. Number one, Todd has a son. Number two, Todd has the means to get to a park. Number three, a park actually exists for Todd to go to. And I can go on and on and on. I don't want to bore you with the ling linguistics. But if one of those assumptions are untrue, that argument falls apart. So let's say that Todd does not have a son. Well, that argument makes no sense. Same thing with any other concept, any other ideology, any other movement, 
any other, any other uh, uh, philosophy that exists in the world, including that of modern day environmentalism. So I define modern day environmentalism by the following principles. I define them by the following principles. Number one, the man nature relationship. And by the way, I'm going to explain all these principles to you as the video goes on. Number two, the concept of no growth. Number three, the town country distinction. Number four, social progress over material progress. Number five, primitivism. These are the five defining characteristics from my own research that I have found undergird the modern day environmentalist movement. I would encourage you to write all of those down because I'm going to fill in the blanks for you as this video goes on. And I'll just say this before I, get, before I continue. It's not enough to dismiss the climate activists and the environmentalists with statistics, data, all that kind of stuff. Data comes after you have constructed a sound argument. So many people, especially so many of us on the right, rush towards data, rush towards coarse grain charts, and we sacrifice ourselves upon the altar of these numbers as opposed to understanding that the antecedent, what comes before the numbers are valid, are ideas meant to guide them. A statistic existing out there in the ether means nothing, but a statistic informed by a sound worldview can open up the door to bro broader meaning, higher meaning, and it can help you pursue the truth. I want all of you to have that fruitful view of statistics and to use them correctly. I'm, I'm begging you because this is an existential threat to our understanding, this over-reliance on statistics and also, Many of you may ask, why am I going through this exercise? Ideas precede action. Every action undertaken in this world is first initiated by an idea. My idea behind coming towards all of you and speaking on this movement is initiated by my desire to help you all understand just how cynical and just how foul and just how incorrect the premises of the environmentalist movement are. Similarly, there are ideas that motivate people to go out in the streets and glue their hands to the streets and try to stop oil and all that kind of stuff and push for ESG and push for the elimination of gasoline cars and push for the elimination of natural gas and all those things. There's ideas behind it and we have to understand those ideas before we can actually truly get to the bottom of what we are seeing. So let's actually explore this a little bit more. Mo the foundations of modern day environmentalism are represented by what two factions from my research, two factions. One of these factions says that the reason there is an ecological crisis, there's an environmental crisis, there is deforestation, there is mass pollution, there's all these things, there's greenhouse, gas, there's greenhouse gases uh, melting the ice caps. The reason all of these things are happening is because we don't have the right values. This faction, let's call them faction A, of the environmentalist movement says that the, 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 the bad environmental outcomes happening in the West right now are entirely due to us having the wrong ideas surrounding the environment, not merely carelessness, not merely meaningless behavior, but it's us having the wrong ideas surrounding the environment. Now there's another faction that says this focus on ideas is a little bit too weird and the true culprit is our current economic environment. This faction more so points to capitalism as the culprit of, of, of the current ecological crisis that supposedly exists and will cause chaos, destruction, all kind of stuff. Now, many of you may say, well, this sounds like Marxism. Yes and no. So it's true. There are things called eco-Marxists. There are environmentalists who are actually Marxist and whose critiques center on capitalism. But even within the roots and the foundational factions of environmentalism, there's actually a tension between the Marxist and the non-Marxist. And I'm gonna to get to that in a second, but we shouldn't assume that just because an environmentalist critiques capitalism, and really when they critique capitalism, they're not really critiquing capitalism, they are critiquing what they see as the idea, the cult of material progress. What does that mean? Well, this cult of material progress says that Society progresses and man progresses on the basis of sort of material accumulation, accumulation of wealth, all that kind of thing, which according to environmentalists is not how things actually happen. Uh, in fact, David Pepper, who wrote a book that I'm citing heavily in this video called The Roots of Modern Environmentalism, says that environmentalists tend to believe that the 
within the framework of the, of the roots of the environmentalist movement, they tend to believe that the kind of society that is ecologically feasible and stable and therefore socially desirable, I'm quoting him, uh, is where social progress is not measurable by material terms, but is instead measurable by social justice and spiritual progression. You're going to see this kind of abstract phrase used here a lot in this video, the sort of spiritual progression, social justice. That's the general sentiment. Whereas those who critique capitalism are saying that capitalism is a force for materialism, and materialism views the environment in a certain way that makes it so the environment is being exploited and not actually cared for, and therefore that's the source of our woes. Again, two different factions with the same kind of aim, and the aim is ultimately to change how we see our relationship with the environment. Because both of them come down to both things. The environmentalist movement, the claim is that people don't see nature in the correct way. Now, I must go to the, the, the foundational text, in my opinion, of modern day environmentalism, which was written in the 1970s. And by the way, in the 1970s, there was a bunch of things relating to environmentalism coming out. You had the Club for Growth, the Club, the club no, excuse me, Club for Rome, Club, club, club of Rome, which, which put out a pamphlet called Limits to Growth which basically predicted doom and gloom if we didn't actually catch up and deal with the ecological crisis. And it was the same kind of thing that we're using too much resources, we're growing our population. And there were several other pamphlets and books and articles written in the 70s reflecting this theme of limited space, limited time, overpopulation, basically. And so during the 70s, that was a rich moment for the formation of the environmentalist movement. So this gentleman called Lynn White, who was a professor of history, uh, delivered this, uh, wrote an article and delivered a talk as well to the American Association for the Advancement of Science called The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis. And this is one of the weirdest, craziest, asinine articles I think I've ever read in my entire life. I'm going to quote a few excerpts from it. But in this article, I'll summarize, he basically says that the reason why there's so much environmental catastrophe is because man has become displaced in the land by the invention of the Industrial Revolution and the, and the advent of tools that make it easier for him to work in reality. And also, before that, man's entire relationship and view of the environment and view of nature is no longer one of being a caretaker and a shepherd or even a worshiper of the environment. It's one of being an exploiter. And he blames this man-nature relationship, which he calls, he twistly says, on Christianity. He says that in the medieval times, there was this idea, the science of revolution, uh, brought forth by people like Francis Bacon, uh, who was a famous scientist who helped invent a lot of things and helped contribute a lot to the history, intellectual history of science, that basically said that through, the, through innovation, man can, can use the environment for his own purposes. And therefore, according to Lynn White, this coupled with the Christian view of the environment, which in his opinion, views us as distinct from it, with dominion over it, essentially created the conditions that have led to all of these economic catastrophes, the ecological crisis, as the title of his book says. I'll, I will actually, I will quote directly from it. He says that, I personally doubt that disa disastrous ecologic backlash can be avoided simply by applying to our problems more science and more technology. Our science and technology have grown out of Christian attitudes toward man's relation to nature, which are almost universally held not only by Christians and neo-Christians, but also by those who are fondly, who fondly regard themselves as post-Christians. Despite Copernicus, all the cosmos rotates around our little globe. Despite Darwin, we are not in our hearts part of the natural process. We are superior to nature, contemptuous of it, and willing to use it for our slightest whim. The newly elected governor of California, like myself a churchman but less troubled than I, spoke for the Christian tradition when he said, as is alleged, when you've seen one redwood tree, you've seen them all. To a Christian, he goes on to say, a tree can no longer be more than a physical fact. The whole concept of a sacred grove is alien to Christianity and the ethos of the West. For nearly two millennia, Christian missionaries have been chopping down sacred groves, which are idolatrous because they assume spirit and nature. 
So Lynn White, the, the entire basis of his claim is that by not seeing ourselves as a product or integral to nature, but instead seeing ourselves as separate or not necessarily in nature, but taking control over nature, we have perpetuated a, a idea which puts into effect a lot of bad outcomes for the environment. And he blames this squarely on Christianity because the idea that you know Christians believe God created the world and Christians don't necessarily believe that nature itself is sacred. They believe that the transcendent beyond the natural world is sacred. Therefore, their lack of emphasis on nature being sacred is precisely what has premeditated a lot of these ecological disasters. This is what he says. Now, there's a few problems with this. Number one, the spirit of civilization is birthed from fire, and fire reflects creativity. Very simply, my friends, Lynn's complaint is that civilization grew out of a desire to conform nature to our desires as opposed to us conforming ourselves to nature's desires, which really doesn't make much sense if you think about it because nature doesn't have desires. It's, it's, an, it's a process, an inanimate, impersonal process that we just exist in. It just is. It's not anything particularly special. But but it, it, his complaint comes out of that desire for us to conform our uh, nature to our desires. But civilization, the impulse, the social impulse in man, quite literally birthed civilization. And this is pre-Christian. Primitive man became civilized man, not because he heard the Sermon on the Mount or became a, a follower of Jesus Christ, but because he realized that as he grew, as he explored the world more, and as he discovered more, and as he stumbled into things which enhanced his life, he realized there was more to life than simply living in caves and living in subsistence. And in fact, Lynn White actually says that in his ideal society, before industrialization, subsistence farming, that means just living barely above your means, just living at the basic line possible, basically in poverty, is ideal. Which kind of gets into the deeper, I, the deeper philosophies here, which I, I think are rather absurd. But another thing that Lynn White says, I think it should, like all of our eyes go big, is how he emphasizes the mission of the environmentalist. He says, for example, that the greatest spiritual revolutionary in Western history, St. Francis, a Catholic saint, proposed what he thought a Christian alternative view of nature would be, and man's relation to it. He tried to substitute the idea of the equality of all creatures, including man, for the idea of man's limitless rule creation. He failed. Both our, he goes on to how the scientific and technological ideas of our age are informed by Christianity. But here's what he says that really caught my eye. Since the roots of our trouble are so largely religious, the remedy must also be essentially religious. Whatever we call it that, whether we call it that or not, we must rethink and refill our nature and destiny. The profoundly religious but heretical sense of premise, primitive Franciscans for the spiritual autonomy of all parts of nature may point a direction. I propose Francis as a patron saint for ecologists. This is Lynn White in the foundational text of modern environmentalism. Environmentalism is a secular religion. Here's the proof. Here's the proof. Now, Lynn White says something that's quite interesting, because we have commentators in our current world that may say, well, Christian, this is all Marxism. Again, I have to caution you against that sentiment. Why? Because Lynn White, in his own essay, basically says that Marxism is a Judeo-Christian heresy. Why does he say this? He says this because he claims that Marxism grows out of this idea of perpetual material progress, and therefore leaves no room for man to have an equal understanding of the environment and just leaves room for materialistic constructs. Now, he's not entirely incorrect. Marxism definitely does have a dialectical materialist process where it says that uh, there will be two classes and one class will eventually overtake the other. Da, 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 da. He's correct about that, but he's definitely incorrect by saying Marxism is Christian or Judeo. It's not at all. It's actually a rejection. It's a atheistic philosophy which rejects the transcendent, and so therefore it couldn't be. But this is the sentiment of a large swath of early environmentalists that believe that Marxism was actually bad. And so what we've established here is that the foundational text of modern day environmentalism, which presumes that Christianity is the ending, which presumes that man's impulse to pursue his potential and grow by conforming the world to his need, which is, which is a, a prerequisite for civilization is a bad thing. All of that in this essay is chalked up 
to be the cause of our problems. Now, that is the man-nature relationship. Let's talk about other things I've talked about very quickly. The town-country distinction. Now, this is where the Marxists come in. The Marxists come in and say, okay, towns are actually derivative of the countryside. The countryside is what actually existed first. And you'll, you'll find this a lot with environmentalists. They will literally worship the rural areas. They will worship the countryside. They will praise it and say, this is our idea of society, which is why I say that environmentalism is first and foremost a primitive philosophy. But here's what they say. The Marxists will say the countryside after the Industrial Revolution was exploited by towns that grew out from it and uh, amassed in urban centers and urban environments, so much so that the distinction between country and town became like oppressor and oppressed, kind of like the distinction between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. And so this is a, actually a very important principle to many environmentalists, which is actually fundamentally Marxist, whether they realize it or not, um, but they believe this, and they believe that the relationship between the countryside and the town is inherently exploitative. Now, again, why don't I think this is true? Well, very simply, I don't believe that social progress or human growth, which is what the development of towns kind of represents, is a zero-sum game. The fact that you have industrial farms in the countryside making millions of dollars, which are then put into lo local economies, which employ a lot of people in those areas, which are traditionally poor, countrysides are traditionally poor, is not necessarily a bad thing. It's actually a great thing. And it kind of just proves this idea that this entire thing is exploitative. For the Marxist or for the person that does not, cannot understand the true first principles of a free economy, anything that involves someone else benefiting from your work is exploitative, which is just not true. If you believe that we live in an interactive society uh, that is generated by an even more interactive economy, which repays both the producer and the producee for what they do. But again, the town-country distinction is derivative of a broader Marxist thinking that we understand is just not true, not, not, not correct. Uh, but also, if you keep going on, the, the, the idea of no growth also feeds into this. So you may hear of this term degrowth, which is actually a movement uh, that is a derivative of the environmentalist creed, which basically says we need to actually scale back the amount of growth we have, cut back on a lot of things, make our cities smaller, make our town smaller. It's basically a philosophy of austerity and subsistence, and, and the environmentalists will actually realize that. They will deny the importance of human progress because they worship the environment as a spiritual entity, as Lynn White covered, as a religious force, and therefore degrowth is justified on those grounds because, again, they're not, they're not approaching this from, rash, from rational sound argumentation. They're approaching this from a place of religious fervor, a place of spiritual fervor, which in my opinion, even if it is spiritual and is religious, is, is founded on incorrect metaphysical assumptions. Nature is not sacred. Nature just is. But that's a different gripe, different day. And I'll get into that in a second. And so we have to understand that, that, that when they say degrowth, they're talking about allowing the world, allowing nature to reclaim itself and therefore shedding the, the products of innovation within our world. Now, no growth is a, is a similar idea, but it has a sort of different premise. The premise of no growth is that small communities, small scale communities that exist within the vestiges of nature, there's actually a, a, a formal word for this, it's called a garden city. A garden city is basically a city that has very little industrial prowess and exists within nature and tries to derive from the land and also take care of it. So that's basically what they want. They want garden cities. And it's really an absurd concept, which again, uh, can only really exist if you, if, 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 if the if the desire to achieve human potential is so limited that it doesn't want to aspire beyond the mere subsistence. Uh, again, this environmentalism is a philosophy of misanthropy. It is a philosophy of hatred of humanity because it literally debases man to the level of lower ordered beings, which is why when Lynn White says he wants equality amongst the animals, well, I'm sorry, human beings are not equal to lower order animals. A human being is not equal to an ant. A human being is not equal to a spider. We are higher order animals who have the ability to understand abstraction, which distinguishes us from everyone else, to reason our way through the world, to create civilization, to derive more from the world than it derives from us. Every other animal on this planet can only derive as much from the world as it derives from them, which is essentially very little. It's just instinct. It's just barely surviving. Man is not meant to survive, he's meant to thrive. And the environmentalist ethos rejects that.
But no Grove cities say, yes, have primitive small scale societies because that will allow the natural world to exist more bountifully and exist more conclusively than previously held. Another, another idea that is quite, quite powerful amongst environmentalists is the idea that social progress cannot be related to material progress. So they basically believe that a society that is good and ecologically sound is a society that does not at all take into account how much growth you have in terms of money, in terms of buildings, in terms of GDP, in terms of any of that. All that matters is your personal beliefs and values and how they inform you as a person. Now, while I think that values and, and personal beliefs are very important, and while I reject materialism on every level, I also understand that values are the antecedents, the, the predicates to man being able to obtain material splendor. Values and the progression of an economy or the progression of, the, uh, of, of human life from a lower state to a higher state are not at odds. They are, in fact, in tandem if they are understood correctly. A lot of the environmentalist position really can just be talked down to ignorance, religious, primitive religious ignorance. It doesn't actually take into account the full scope of the nature of these concepts. To say that values and material progress are opposed is the same thing as saying that swimming and drowning are one and the same. No, they're not. If you know how to swim, i.e. if you have the right value about swimming, you are most likely not going to drown if you are smart about it. But if you don't have any value about something whatsoever and you just view it as an activity, then you may very well drown. But the values un that undergird your desire to swim are directly connected to your survival in the water. The values that undergird your desire to progress as a human being are directly connected to your material splendor. This is why successful people, rich people, tend to have better mindsets, tend to be very hardworking in, some, in many cases, in some cases they're not, but they tend to have different mindsets than those who are poor, not because they're better, but because they have the right values. But environmentalism says that the material world if it is used in any way, in any other way, except from which, whence it came, or except in a way that actually enhances its processes, that is evil, that is disrespectful, and that is indicative of exploitation. But it's not. It's the exact opposite, as I have explained. So my friends, this is going to, this is a very brief overview. This is not the entire primer on environmentalism, but let's recap what we learned. The roots of modern day environmentalism are a mixture, for example, of Marxist sentiments about town and country, of primitivism, of a, a sense of distress about man's relationship with nature, <coughs> of this belief that every material thing, every material progress is evil. And it's also the sensibility, the sort of religious sensibility about the nature of the environment. As Lynn White said, this is a religious movement. And in my opinion, the people of the West should treat it as a religious movement. What's scary is that even though only a small percentage of people have heard of Lynn White, many people have heard of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And that association is actually where Lynn White delivered the talk I just went through to. And that same association in 2016 actually lobbied Congress to ban greenhouse gases and to, and to encourage regulation, which encourages adaptation, in other words, which forces green technologies, which are oftentimes inefficient, upon, a, upon entire, entire economies. The same man who helped found modern day environmentalism, there are so many footnotes to Len White's article, is the same man whose ideas are informing the modern day scientific establishment. That is why I put so much emphasis on White and his works. But there are others, of course. And so again, if you guys want to learn more, I encourage you to read the article for yourself and also read David Pepper's the roots of environmentalism, it will be very eye-opening to you. My friends, religious fervor over our natural world is not necessary to appreciate our natural world. What is necessary to appreciate our natural world is a rational understanding of the purpose of nature, man's place in it, which is not as a serf or observant or a subsistence lover, but as a victor, a conqueror, and someone who pursues human potential so he can maximize his ability to live in accordance with truth, live in accordance with reality, and not live in accordance merely to base instinct. That is the role, the, the man-nature relationship in its proper sense. And if you can essentially understand that, the claims of the environmentalist lobby should become nonsensical to you. Now, the statistical claims about all these other things, you know, they are a different story for a different day, although I'll say this much. 
Malthusianism, the idea that population growth will eventually make society collapse, has been debunked many times, but I'll just give you a, a brief primer on why I think it's personally wrong, because Malthusianism does not take into account the dynamic potential of human growth. It only takes into account statistics or measurements taken at one place in time that do not consider broader factors, which is why most environmentalism, I mean, you hear a lot about ecological catastrophe and you hear a lot about small scale communities, it all derives from the fallacy of Malthusianism. So again, would you rather believe religious ideas based on specious fallacies that sometimes seem plausible, or would you rather accord yourself with reality and, and be a steward of the environment on the basis of sound thinking that does not have any political benefit, but has benefit instead to the growth of your understanding. I know what I want. How about you? My friends, love you guys so much. If you love me, like this video, comment on this video, share this video, subscribe to this channel, donate to me on Patreon, PayPal, Locals, all that will be in the conversation down below. Join our Discord, which is also in the comment section down below. I love you guys so much, and please stay pensive. Bye, guys.